Hi, my name is Autumn Dixon, and this week is May 6th through the 12th of the Come Follow Me program associated with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And this week, we're going to be talking about Mosiah chapters 7 through 10. Now, the stories for this part of the Book of Mormon, they can be kind of confusing sometimes <laughs> because it kind of jumps around in the timeline. And then we also find sermons intermingled with that. You're talking about different groups of people. And so it can just all kind of blend together and be difficult to follow if you're not really just simply trying to follow that timeline. And so I wanted to actually kind of lay the story out just a little bit so we can get kind of a context for what I want to be talking about today because I want to talk about Lim Heist people in general. And that means part of the story is kind of going to be folding into the coming weeks, right? But all of the principles that I want to talk about are found in verses from this week. So I'm going to kind of tell the story so we have context. And that'll spread out, but the verses and the principles that I want to talk to you do stay true to this week. Now, King Limhi's people. So I'm going to rewind a little bit, and we're going to start at the beginning. So there was all of the Nephites. They were all in one big group of people. And there was a man named Zenith, and he, he felt like he was supposed to. He felt like they were supposed to be inheriting the original land that they had found when... Laman and Lemuel and Nephi had first come to the promised land, right? So they all came over, and then the Lord tells Nephi, you need to get out of that land and take the righteous people with you. So Nephi left and fled from Laman and Lemuel. Well, all the Nephites are over here, and Zedeph is like, hey, I feel like we should be inheriting that land that was originally there. So he takes a big group of people. They all go over to where the Lamanites are. Zedeph talks to the Lamanite king, and the Lamanite king lets them settle on their land. And everything goes well for a little while. And then the Lamanites come against Zenith's people, trying to overtake them and basically make them slaves. And they beat back the Lamanites, and they rejoice, and it's wonderful. And time moves on, Zenith dies, and his son, King Noah, comes in, and the people grow very wicked. And eventually, I know I'm omitting a lot of details, but I want to kind of stay true to this timeline that I want to talk about for these principles. So the Lamanites actually do come in and they overtake this group of Nephites that had settled in their land. And this is where we find King Limhi. So King Limhi, Limhi was the son of King Noah, and he is over, he is king over this people who are in bondage to the Lamanites. Now, the scope of today's message, what I want to be talking about. there, Like I said, there's a couple of different groups of people that we're looking at in this part of the scriptures. So we have Limhi's people. We also have Alma's people who originally used to be with Limhi, but they broke apart, which is another story. Now, Alma's people, they were brought into bondage despite the fact that they were righteous. And Limhi's people were brought into bondage because they had been wicked. Right? They had followed King Noah, fallen into wickedness. They no longer had the Lord's protection, and they fell into bondage because of that wickedness. Now, I believe that repentance, the scope of repentance in my mind, is anytime we're taking a step closer to Christ. So in my mind, Alma's people who found themselves in bondage despite the fact that they were righteous, they were building strength, right? In my mind, that is still repentance, right? They're still growing closer to Christ. They're still becoming more like Christ because they're struggling and growing, right? But that's not the kind of repentance I want to talk about today. The kind of repentance that I want to talk about today is much more in line with King Limhi and his people. And so the scope of repentance that I want to talk about today is specifically overcoming sin. That's what I want to focus on. So when I'm talking about repentance today, normally I'm talking about it in its broader scope where we're trying to become like Christ in a variety of ways. But today I want to talk about it in the context of just trying to overcome bondage, to overcome sins. Now, one of the parallels that we find, because I want to talk about Limhi's people, right? One of the parallels that we find between his people and repentance, 
I feel like comes from King Limhi himself, right? When we look at King Limhi as a character in and of himself, we can find a lot of really important lessons about repentance. Now, when you think about King Limhi, we actually don't know that much about him. We know that he is the son of King Noah, who is a very wicked king, right? We don't know a lot of his past, like how involved he was with his father. We don't know how involved he was in his future duties as king when they were persecuting Abinadi and killing Abinadi. We don't know how much Lim- Limhi was aware of what was going on. We don't know how much he participated in his father's wickedness. We really don't know that much about King Limhi. But we do have this from King Limhi. So this is Mosiah, it's chapter 7, and it's verses 25 to 26. So his people are in bondage, and King Limhi is speaking to his people, and this is what he said. So we have this context of he, he had this wicked father, right? But this is what he says. He says, For this, if this people had not fallen into transgression, the Lord would not have suffered that this great evil should come upon them. But behold, they would not hearken unto his words. But there arose contentions among them, even so much that they did shed blood among themselves. And a prophet of the Lord had they slain, yea, a chosen man of God, who told them of their wickedness and abominations, and prophesied of many things which are to come, yea, even the coming of Christ. I want you to think about Limhi for a little bit, right? He knew that his people had done wrong, and he didn't shy away from it. He was like, you guys transgressed, and you were killing each other, and you killed a prophet, right? He totally calls it out. And I want you to think about where Limhi came from. He was raised in this wicked society with this wicked father. His experience with religion <laughs> was not positive. He, His father had cast out all the priests and brought in his own wicked priests. They did whatever they wanted, and they're like, okay, this is what righteousness is. This is what righteousness looks like. That was Limhi's experience with religion, right? But here we see Limhi completely owning up to transgression, and he is talking about how they killed a prophet despite, despite what he had been raised with, right? And I think that speaks a lot for Limhi. It would have been very easy for him to be completely self-absorbed, right? That was his example. It would have been very easy for him to surround himself with yes men who were telling him, you're doing everything right. It wasn't your fault that you're in bondage, right? Surrounding himself with this echo chamber that was going to stroke his ego just like his father had done. But that's not what he had done, right? That's not what he did. He could have honestly turned away from religion completely, (laughs) This isn't, comp- this isn't really fertile soil. With what he observed of religion, hypocrisy, pride, people doing whatever they want, calling it righteousness, it would have been very easy for him to just completely drop religion altogether, but that's not what he did. Somehow, Limhi was an unbaptized convert just waiting for the missionaries to come along and baptize him. He... We're not sure how he learned about the character of God, right? Because he sure wasn't learning it from his father (laughs) or the nature of sin. We don't know where he learned these things. However, he was able to shed that example that had been given to him. And he took on the mantle of king over a people who were in bondage, even though it maybe wasn't his fault in the slightest. He took on that mantle. And then he called his people out and were like, hey, we sinned and that's why we're in bondage, right? We killed a prophet, which is so interesting because that was exactly what Abinadi was killed for, was calling them out and telling them that they were sinning. But Limhi owned it. Despite everything that he had been through, despite his entire experience with religion, he saw that sin had been done and that that's what had brought them into bondage, into unhappiness. If we are to look at Limhi's people and find parallels with repentance, if we were to look at King Limhi as the primary state of mind when we're trying to approach repentance, Limhi was ready to repent. He was ready to change. And that is really, really significant. He was ready to change. This attitude, this preparation for repentance includes ownership 
right, of the sin. He owned it despite all of the circumstances that he had been given, despite the fact that he wasn't dealt a really great hand. He didn't use that as an excuse. He was like, okay, we transgressed and it brought us into bondage. So let's change this so we can have a different circumstance, right? He owned it. He was also willing to look for help, right? He, when Ammon came along, he's like, oh my goodness, the Nephites can come and help us. And he was willing to look for that help, which is also really important when we're looking to move towards repentance. He was willing to do penance, right? He told Ammon, we can be the slaves to the Nephites, which that idea was shot down really fast. But his willingness to do penance was a big deal, right? He was willing to be like, we're going to pay for what we did and we're going to pay back the Nephites for coming in and helping us. All of these things contributed to the readiness of his people to be saved, to be freed from bondage, to be freed from sin. So Limhi's people, they are in bondage, and the Nephites send along all the Nephites that were still over here, right? Limhi went over to the Lamanite lands. All the Nephites over here, they start to wonder what happened to Zenith and his people. So they decide that they're going to send some people to go look for them and see what happened to them. So they send Ammon and a group of men to go and look for these people who had been lost. And when they arrive, Limhi is overjoyed. So here is a verse about that. This is Mosiah. It's chapter 7. It is verse 18. And he is, once again, he's talking to his people right as, right as Ammon has come in. And he sees deliverance. It says, And it came to pass that when they had gathered themselves together, so Limhi's people gathered themselves, that he spake unto them in this wise, saying, O ye my people, lift up your heads and be comforted. For behold, the time is at hand, or is not far distance, when we shall no longer be in subjection to our enemies, notwithstanding our many strugglings, which have been in vain. Yet I trust there remaineth an effectual struggle to be made. Now there's kind of dual principles here. In this verse that I want to talk about that is really key to understanding repentance. Limhi was thrilled. He knew that his people had reason to lift up their heads and rejoice because he knew deliverance was coming. He knew that they were not abandoned, that someone was coming to help them and that they were going to be okay. And he rejoiced over this. But there's one phrase at the end that I think is so important, right? I trust there remaineth an effectual struggle to be made. And I'm totally imagining this in my head, so I know that this might not be how it happened or where he got this impression, but I imagine Limhi speaking to his people, and he's like, this is it. Like, they came. Like, we're going to be freed. This is wonderful. But then kind of pausing and being like, almost receiving revelation, right? Being like, I feel like there's still going to be an effectual struggle to be made before we're going to find our freedom. And it's this effectual struggle that I really want to delve into to understand. Now, effectual means to produce the desired result. So when we're talking about this freedom, I want to talk about freedom in its truest sense. Freedom from bonds, freedom from sin. Now, I want you to imagine being in Limhi situation, Right? And just temporally speaking, you work super, super hard all the time to free your people from this bondage. And you're finally successful. You get them out of Lamanite lands and out from under the Lamanite king and all of the problems that came with being in bondage to them. And everybody celebrates and it's wonderful and amazing. And then you wake up the next morning and they've run right back into their bonds, <laughs> right? you would be super annoyed. <laughs> At least I would be super annoyed. Maybe you wouldn't be, but I would be super annoyed that they had just run right back into bondage. Now, this is really silly and it probably wouldn't happen, but it happens spiritually often enough, right? And that's where we can understand this effectual struggle. The Lord requires an effectual struggle of us in repentance, right? And it's going to depend on where you're at spiritually and what you're repenting of. But in general, repentance is going to require an effectual struggle. But understanding the purpose of this effectual struggle is so essential to actually to actually repenting, 
in what repenting is meant to be. The effectual struggle is not because Heavenly Father wants to punish you for not listening to Him. That's not His purpose. It is not so that you can pay for your sins because Christ did that. The effectual struggle, its purpose is to keep you from going back and running back straight into your bonds, right? I want you to imagine (laughs) that the Lord just bailed you out every time you were freed, right? You run into sin and then you're like, Heavenly Father, I don't want to be here anymore. I'm in bonds. And he just releases you, right? If he bailed you out every time without an effectual struggle, how often would you run right back into those bonds, right? That effectual struggle is Heavenly Father's gift to us to help us remain free of bondage. There's so much beautiful growth and those consequences, experiencing enough of the consequences of our sins is so healthy because it keeps us from running straight back into the bonds. He, Heavenly Father's son, Jesus Christ, already paid for it. Heavenly Father doesn't really care to punish us. He doesn't really have an ego that's just that's not what he's about he wants to help us change when he allows an effectual struggle when he allows us to feel guilt it's because he wants us to change for real he wants us to be freed from those bonds and to not run straight back into them now i said that there were dual principles in this verse and we have this effectual struggle but there was another part it says that they Limhi wanted his people to lift up their heads and be comforted, right? He wanted them to lift up their heads and rejoice. So I want you to think about this idea that you have this effectual struggle when you're repenting. And that effectual struggle is really healthy and it's meant to contribute to your change and your growth. And it's supposed to help you learn not to run right back into your bonds. But it should also come with the understanding that we are freed that Christ did pay for our sins, that we can lift up our heads and rejoice. He already paid for the sins. We are already safe, right? Like our happy ending is safe. And so when we're, we're experiencing this effectual struggle, we don't have to be afraid of it, right? We don't have to be scared of it. We can know what it's for to help us grow. And we can lift up our heads and rejoice and have gratitude in the Savior for saving us. And we can be simultaneously grateful that he's letting us, allowing us to have this effectual struggle so that we can be better. I want to bear my testimony of my Heavenly Father and my Savior Jesus Christ and their love for us. They sent us here to grow, right? That's their purpose. It underlies every single one of their choices. All of their decisions that they make in regards to us comes back to that central purpose of helping us grow and change. Now, I'm grateful that the Savior came down here and paid for my freedom, that he paid for my experience to come down here, struggle, grow, experience opposition, all of these things that I needed in order to be able to be capable of finding happiness in the eternities. He paid for me to have that experience because he knew it would require me finding myself in bonds. He paid for that so that I could be freed and my happy ending could be safe. I am also grateful that my Savior was wise enough and loved me enough to let me still experience an effectual struggle. Because without that effectual struggle, it wouldn't have mattered that he paid for my sins. I would have kept running straight back into those bonds. I wouldn't have learned from the opposition that I was experiencing. I am grateful that I have learned about repentance and that it has become a beautiful thing to me. That I, that an effectual struggle no longer means beating myself up over every flaw or every imperfection because that's not effectual in the slightest. I'm grateful that repentance to me has come to mean a deep gratitude in my Savior and growth. And that is beautiful to me. The effectual struggle has become still painful, but has become more beautiful to me. And I'm grateful for my Savior and my Heavenly Father for allowing those experiences. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.